In the last two videos, we have looked at how propulsive power is supplied to the vehicle by its powertrain. In order to understand the dynamics of a vehicle, it is also important to have some idea about the components that are built into it. In this video, we will return to the actual dynamics of the vehicle in its longitudinal direction. So for a first overview, let's look at the balance of forces in the longitudinal direction of the car. For simplicity of the following presentation, we assume that all steering angles of the car are equal to zero. The first relevant force component is the slope force and it's caused by the weight of the vehicle that attacks at its center of gravity, a fraction of which also pulls the vehicle in its longitudinal direction and this fraction is given by the sine of the slope angle lambda. So the total slope force is mg times the sine of lambda. The second relevant force component is the aerodynamic drag force, which obviously depends on the current speed of the vehicle. The third relevant longitudinal force component is the rolling resistance forces, which act on the individual tires. So there's a total of four rolling resistance forces. Here, the index I runs over all four tires, meaning the front left, the front right, the rear left and the rear right tire. And the fourth relevant force component in the longitudinal direction is the tire forces. These are due to the contact between the tire and the road and they are in particular the forces that propel the vehicle or break the vehicle. So given all these longitudinal force components by the center of gravity principle, we get that the mass times the longitudinal acceleration of the vehicle is equal to the sum of all these forces, where we have to take into account, of course, that some of these forces may be acting against the direction of travel of the vehicle and hence enter with a minus sign and some forces enter the equation with a plus sign. Next, what we'll do is go through the list of all of these forces and look at them in a little more detail. As the slope force is pretty much self-explanatory, we'll start with the aerodynamic drag force. Let's begin with the aerodynamic drag force. Under the assumption that the airflow direction is aligned with the orientation of the vehicle, meaning that air only flows in the longitudinal direction of the vehicle, the aerodynamic drag force can be approximated by this formula. Assuming for a moment that the wind speed is zero, you can see from this formula that the aerodynamic drag force increases quadratically with the longitudinal speed of the vehicle. Moreover, the aerodynamic force is proportional to the mass density of air, the frontal area of the vehicle and the aerodynamic drag coefficient. The aerodynamic drag coefficient is a dimensionless quantity that is related to the geometric shape of the vehicle. In particular, for a given frontal area of a vehicle, the aerodynamic drag coefficient specifies how large the aerodynamic force will be. So the lower the aerodynamic drag coefficient of a vehicle, the lower is the resistance due to aerodynamic forces. As we can see from this diagram, the aerodynamic drag coefficient depends on how the air flows around the vehicle and also underneath the vehicle. So it is related to the entire geometric shape of the vehicle and how streamlined the vehicle is built. For example, the aerodynamic drag coefficient of a simple plate with length zero is about 1.15. Then if the length of that plate is extended from zero to a positive value, so the plate forms a cuboid, then the first thing that will happen is that the drag coefficient will go down to a minimum value of about 0.82. And then if the length is increased further, 
the aerodynamic drag coefficient will increase approximately linearly with the length of the cuboid. Of course, small roundings in the edges of that cuboid will already have a large effect in lowering the aerodynamic drag coefficient. To give you a rough idea of the aerodynamic drag coefficient for passenger vehicles, here's a little diagram that shows the development of the aerodynamic drag coefficient from a historical perspective. As you can see, in the very early days of the automobile development process, in the year 1920, the aerodynamic drag coefficient was in the range between about 0.6 and 0.8. And in modern passenger vehicles of the year 2020, it has come down to the range of about 0.25 to 0.35. So how is the aerodynamic drag coefficient determined in practice? Well, for simple geometric shapes, such as a cuboid, it can be calculated analytically. The complexity of the shape of a vehicle makes this next to impossible. So the practical way to do this is to put the vehicle into a wind tunnel and measure the forces that result on the vehicle. Of course, in reality, the situation is far more complex because the wind can approach the vehicle from different angles. And this will result in additional forces and moments that act also in other directions, but the longitudinal direction of the vehicle. But it will also influence the size of the aerodynamic force. So that's why the assumption that the airflow direction is the same as the orientation of the vehicle is somewhat of a simplification. However, it is, of course, a good approximation for many situations in reality. Next, Let's look in more detail at the rolling resistance forces generated by the tires of a vehicle. The main cause of the rolling resistance is the tire's deformation in the tire thread as well as the sidewall of the tire due to the vertical load and the tire is not 100% elastic. This means that there is some internal damping in the material of the tire that causes a loss of energy during that deformation process and that appears as a resistive force that acts in the opposite direction to the tire's rolling direction. Of course, there's also a little bit of friction in the wheel's bearing, which adds to the rolling resistance of the wheel. However, it is generally small compared with the resistance that is caused by the tire's deformation. Experimental results show that the resistive force is roughly proportional to the vertical tire force, meaning the weight that the vehicle puts on this tire plus the weight of the tire itself. The proportional relationship is expressed by this formula, which states that the resistive force is equal to some constant times the vertical tire load, where the constant FR is called the rolling resistance coefficient. Typical for passenger vehicles are values of the rolling resistance coefficient in the interval between 0.01 and 0.03. If we look at the rolling resistance in a little more detail, we recognize that this proportional relationship is actually only true in some range of the velocity. In fact, for velocities well above 100 km per hour, the rolling resistance coefficient starts to increase, like a fourth order polynomial. As you can also see from this diagram, radial ply tires generally have a lower rolling resistance compared to bias ply tires, at least up to a certain velocity. So far, we have assumed that the road itself is much stiffer than the tire and hence the deformation of the road can be neglected. However, this clearly does not hold in general. So for example, a radial ply tire on a dry asphalt surface 
may have a rolling resistance coefficient of 0.015. On a gravel road or dry dirt road, the rolling resistance coefficient may then be around 0.05. And on soaked grass, for instance, it could be 0.35. Finally, on a solid surface with standing water with a depth of greater than or equal to 0.5 millimeters, the rolling resistance coefficient grows approximately proportionally with the longitudinal speed of the vehicle to the 1.6. This, of course, is only true until the water reaches a certain depth at which the tire begins to swim, which is also referred to as aquaplaning. Finally, let's turn our attention to the tire forces. The tire forces are the forces that act on the tire due to its interaction with the ground surface. They are actually similar to the lateral tire forces that we have discussed in the section on lateral vehicle dynamics. And we will see the parallels shortly. The main difference is that the tire forces here are used for the longitudinal dynamics of the vehicle, meaning for the acceleration or braking of the vehicle. Similar to the lateral tire forces, where the magnitude of the force was dependent on the slip angle, the longitudinal tire force also depends on the slip between the tire and the ground. And in this case, the slip is called the slip ratio. Moreover, also like for the lateral tire forces, the longitudinal tire forces depend on the vertical load on the tire and the friction coefficient between the tire and the road. The slip ratio of the tire is related to the difference between the tire's theoretical or kinematic speed, omega times its effective radius, and the actual speed v of the tire. This difference is referred to as the longitudinal tire slip, and it's illustrated by the diagram on the left-hand side. Note that if the tire was perfectly rigid and the rolling of the tire was perfectly kinematic, then the corresponding kinematic condition would be that omega times r effective is exactly equal to the speed of the tire v. Now, a non-zero tire slip means that these two speeds do not match exactly. The reason for this could be that there is a relative motion between the tire and the ground in the contact patch. This would mean that the tire is sliding on the ground. However, this is not the only reason, and in fact not even the main reason, for tire slip. Similar to the slip angle for lateral tire forces, the main reason for longitudinal tire slip is the elasticity of the tire. The slip ratio, denoted with sigma x, is now defined as the difference between omega r and v divided by the maximum of these two quantities. So in the case of acceleration, divided by omega r, and in the case of braking, divided by v. Note that if there's an accelerating torque acting on the wheel, meaning that the torque is acting in the direction of the rotation of the wheel, then omega times r will be slightly bigger than v, and hence the slip ratio will be a positive quantity. On the other hand, if there's a braking torque acting on the wheel, so a torque acting against the direction of the rotation of the wheel, then V will be slightly bigger than omega R, and hence sigma X will be a negative quantity. Now the final question to ask is, how does the tire force depend on the slip ratio? And if we look at the explicit dependence of this longitudinal tire force that we will now call Fx on the slip ratio sigma x, it is strongly reminiscent of the relationship between the lateral tire force and the slip angle. In fact, for a fixed vertical load on the tire, the relationship 
looks very much like the relationship that we have seen for the lateral tire forces. Again, there's some interval around the origin of the slip ratio where the tire force is well approximated by a linear relationship with the slip ratio. The slope of this linear relationship is called the longitudinal tire stiffness C sigma. Moreover, if the slip ratio does not become too large, then on this interval, the relationship between the tire force and the slip ratio can be well approximated by a linear tire model, meaning that fx is given as C sigma multiplied with sigma x. Dependence of the longitudinal tire force on other factors such as the vertical tire load, tire parameters and so on are analogous to the lateral tire forces. So please refer to an earlier video on lateral tire models for further details.